go with uh, Professor Khrushchev. And uh, uh, again, I want to apologize ahead of time. Some people have a 12 o'clock class. I understand you uh, need to get, get up and go, and, uh, and everybody understands that. Okay, life happens, right? So I'm going to introduce to you now uh, uh, Mary Hyde. Mary? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm you, sorry sir. our esteemed, esteemed guest is a little late, um, but it's my honor to introduce um, Sir Ben Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, introduction. Thank you for your patience, because we planned it for the long time. Mary was my good student in the Brown University. And first I was sick last semester, and now I'll, I turn on the Route 6, not east but west for some reason, and then found Andre Hobbin that, it, that, you, that you are in different ways. So I try to do the best, but now I will not talk more about my apology. I will start with the Cold War. And the first we have to, to, to think what, what is Cold War. It is something unique, or it is uh, somebody's fault who caused the Cold War. Evilness of Stalin, or evilness of Churchill, or evilness of uh, President Truman. All of them were involved in different aspects in this. But in reality, it was natural in our history, because uh, in the world, we compete for the domination in the world. And uh, in the 20th century, we have two such wars. It was Great Britain and France versus Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And First World War. It was Russia and United States which involved in this war, but really it is these two group of powers who try to find who will be there. <coughs> then we have Second World War, same Great Britain, same France, now same Germany, but now it was no Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was Japan. And also they were who, I will not say cause, but who was brought us to this war. Soviet Union was attacked, United States were attacked, but these two powers try to fight with each other. But then everything changed. At Second World War, these powers were kicked out. Two of them were defeated. Two others became too weak to compete on the, of the, on the world. And two new powers emerged, United States and Soviet Union. And they tried to find out how they can deal with each other in this world. But one big thing changed. It was the nuclear weapons. And now, gradually, not just in 1945, but gradually, governments started to understand that in this nuclear war, they will lose more than they will gain. And nobody starting war when they think that they will lose. But they have no other way to behave because they know how to behave different way than during the war. So the same behavior of war without war. I think it was a very good name for this of the Cold War of the Cold War. It was natural transition. Cold War is now over. It will never return, but it will be competition and confrontation in the world, but it was based now not on the military confrontation, but the economy. Even if it will be some wars, but it will, but the real confrontation now, it will war. It was the same in the end of the second part of the World War. It was two periods in the, in the Cold War. First period from 1945 to 1953, where it really went for the war. If you look at the discussion in the American Congress, the people all the time, time they talk how many Soviet cities have to be destroyed. It depends how many nuclear weapons at that time the United States had. Stalin had no doubts that it will be the new war. And it was such 
changing in the development. Soviet Union ended Second World War with their uh, armed forces, about a little bit more than 10 million people. In 1947, it reduced to 2.5 million people. But then at the threat of the new war, and this feeling that we have to do something, Stalin starting to new build up. And in 1953, the Soviet Union have 5.5 uh, million people. And it was the country that fully destroyed by the Second World War. You have understand, the United States uh, has favored, it was ne never bombed, never attacked. And really, they gained from the war. But in the European part of the Soviet Union, there was no villages, no houses, only chimneys. Everything were destroyed. Railroad destroyed, factory destroyed. Germans do it very, in the, in the very good order, all this destruction. And we have to prepare for the new war. And Americans' preparation, and it was unclear what will be next, when it will happen. Stalin told it will be not later than 1955 when Americans will attack us. And then it was 1952-1953. The General Eisenhower was elected as American president. For Stalin, it was the sign that really Americans decided to go to the war. Because why? they will elect general as the president. But it was different with, with Eisenhower. He was the general, he knew how to fight, but he know also, knew also about the war. So in one of the first meetings in the White House, his advisors, new advisors, started to discuss that we have attacked Soviet Union until it will not be too late. And the new elected president agreed with them that uh, they told the, and we will win. That I agree with you, we will win. But what will be after? And they look at them and they told, we don't know. And they told, if you don't know what will be after the war, you cannot start the war. I think it, it was a good lesson that we've forgotten. Because when President George W. Bush told mission accomplished, he was right. American military won the war in Iraq, and now we see what, what was after. So, and on the Soviet side, it was also big changes because on the March 1st, 53, Stalin died, and new leadership came to the power. So on both sides, they started to think, is it war inevitable, or we can deal with the opposite side? And it was the President Eisenhower spoke in the National Press Club on the April 23rd, 1953, when he talked, we have to try to find out, can we deal with the Soviet Union? Then in May, it was presented similar speech in the House of Commons by the British Prime Minister Churchill. He was Prime Minister for a very short time, but he presented this speech. And at last they met. They met in 1955 in Geneva. And it was very important, we have to understand, meeting between the leaders are very important. Even they have results or don't have results because they look in the eyes of each other. They can present their position. They can listen, look how, how they behave. If you, it is no comparison of communication through the ambassadors, uh, foreign ministers and others. So, and when my father returned, he told, yes, we can deal with American, we can avoid the war, but we have to be strong. It was the same conclusion on the American side when I talk with the people from the Eisenhower administration. We can deal with the Soviet Union, but we have to be strong. But also it was another problem that we are and we were the different civilization. We are Americans and we are Russians. The same as we are Americans and we are Arabs or we are Americans and we are Chinese. And it is creating big problems, misperception, misunderstanding. Because we're making our decision 
including the president, with all the information that he gaining, all this uh, intelligence, listening, listening, big ears, but still you deal with your own experience. And we with you and all them who are on the highest position have only our experience. American experience or Soviet experience. And we behave in this way how we understand the circumstances. Having no idea that maybe on the opposite side it's very, it, everything is very different. So when we talk about the Cold War, it was many aspects when we were very close to the war without any intention to start the war. And it was also fear on the both sides. The opposite side will start the war. It was Pearl Harlem syndrome on this side. It was uh, German attack syndrome on the Soviet side. And here it is one of the things that in Geneva, President Eisenhower came with the idea of the uh, open skies that overfly territory of the both countries to prevent surprise attack. And my father, who became the leader of the Soviet Union, rejected this. And it's created the fear on the American side. What Soviets hiding that they not allowed to overfly our territory. But my father, when he returned from Geneva, he told, you see this photograph that President show me, how detailed they are. How can I allow them to overfly our territory? Because we all, uh, allow Germans to overfly our territory as a goodwill before they attack. And their maps were better than ours maps. Military, and our military use German maps than ours. They're more accurate. If they're preparing for the war, they will make all the photographs and, they, and then they will attack us. Then they will discover how weak we are. It provoked their first strike. And Americans thinking what Soviets hiding. And one of the things that Soviets have uh, hiding nothing except it was nothing to hide. They tried to show that we have nothing. And it was the beginning of this trying to find out how to deal with each other. But it was also a different environment. It was two powers, but American economy roughly at that time was three times bigger than the Soviet economy. And my father told that our priority, not the military built up, we have to improve life of our people. We have long lines, in the bakeries, I'm not talking about groceries. If you will not go stand there in line at six o'clock in the morning, you don't have bread. You have the shortages of the living space, everything were destroyed, and people live not in the houses, not in apartments, they live in room, in rooms. And it have be, can be three generations live in one room, about 150 square feet. So we have to start to build these houses. And we need money for this. And he told, if we waste, be, investing in the production of the weapons, we're wasting this money. Because it is two systems which compete. I will not go too far in all these things. And we believe that our system is better. Both sides believe in this. But that system we took over, not with really more powerful militarily, but which present better life to the people. So if we will overspend all the military, we will be defeated without any war, really what's happened in the Cold War. So we have to think what we really need for our security. And the same 1955, it was a discussion of the future of the Soviet Navy. And my father before was not involved in the military planning. It was Stalin was control all the things. And they have the 10-year program of the build-up of the surface blue water navy, 45, 55. In 55, the naval officers and the shipbuilders present the new plan for about 120 billion rubles, big money at that time. 
that have to be spent. And my father, he was a person who don't like to waste money. He counted each ruble. So he told, ask them, it was one meeting, another meeting, it was endless meetings, why we need all these things. He told, you think we need Navy? We need the Blue Water Navy. Because you want to compete with Americans on the ocean. And the Middle salt, yes. Because now they are <coughs> for there. But he told why we have compete with them in the ocean. We are continental country. We have no plans to invade the United States. We have no communication. Americans have communication with the Hawaii, with the Europe, everything. They have defense communication. They had this experience, First, Second World War. Really understand, they need Navy. Why we need this Navy? And they were still saying, you are not military men, you don't understand. And, and you have, even if my father went through the war, but he was like a political general, he would be very cautious not to make your decision just opposite to the, what military required. So in one of this last this discussion, he asked the commander-in-chief of the Soviet Navy, Admiral Kuznetsov, very brave and very decent man, if today will be the war, can you take over American Navy? And he answered no. And he told, and you ask me to spend 120 billion rubles for the building all these ships with just competing with Americans, which economy three times bigger, so they can build three times more ships than we in these 10 years. So in 10 years we will be even weaker, but we will waste this money. And he told, no, we will not build surface navy. We will build shore defense, Submarines with, with missiles, if it will be possible at the time, it was not very clear, clear. And no surface ships. And we also discharge the, the ships that we have, build these cruisers, new cruisers, just build them, or finishing them, because they're also very expensive. And it was strong opposition of the military. Khrushchev destroying our glory. Even now, if you ask them who was the worst of the, this leader, they told Khrushchev, he destroyed our military glory. But he told, we cannot balance, we, ca we cannot negotiate with Americans on all they think. We have decided for ourselves what we need. And then concentrate on this area and uh, uh, try to save as much money as we can and invest them in the improving life of the people. And he looked around and he told, we have nuclear weapons. We can threaten Americans with the nuclear weapons destruction, but they can destroy our country because they surrounded Soviet Union with their air bases. We are far away from there and the Mm. Aircraft designers reported, they told with the finest, the, uh, the, the best Soviet aircraft designer, Mr. Tupolev, he told, I can build the plane can reach American territory. We have this uh, plane now bare, Tupolev 95, but it will never penetrate American anti aircraft defense. He told, I can build a plane with, which will penetrate American anti-aircraft defense, but it will never reach American territory. So, we can destroy Europe and balance, but it was our real counterpart the, in the other side of the ocean. So they thought, maybe it will be missiles. The missile designer told, we can do it. But it was at that time that they didn't know, if, can you build intercontinental missile or not? It was a multi-stage uh, missile, 
and you know that you have ignite there on the uh, surface, but on the second stage, would it work or not? Nobody know. It was the idea to build ballistic missiles, cruise missiles. In 1915, 1954, they decided, let's start designing of these missiles, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. And they built both of them, but then they found that ballistic missile is uh, better because it was impossible to shoot it. And it was the foundation of the Soviet security and defense. We have to build these missiles and then we can prevent the Second World War because Americans will not attack us if they will understand that it will be the retaliation. But Americans were in Europe and it, it would take time until you can do it. And we first tested these missiles on 1957. And my father tried to uh, threaten Americans, saying that we are strong enough. Don't touch us. And Americans, an American military, and uh, an American military industrial complex like this, they started to talk about the gaps. So it's uh, much ahead of us. It was command of the strategic forces, General Lee May. He created Bomber Gap. If you don't, I don't think you remember this. He told Bomber Gap, they're building these bombers everywhere. They, the Soviet Union filled with uh, strategic bombers. But it was the first U-2 flight before the old reconnaissance. And they make the photograph. And they reported to the President Eisenhower, it is no bombers in the Soviet territory. They have one or two factories, they have maybe 10 planes, but not, no gap. And they just killed this. But then it was my father who was, had this fear that America will attack us on the sense how we're strong. He started to show, no, we are strong. In one of his speeches he told, we now produced missiles like sausages. And I worked at the time in the missile industry, and I was naive and young, and I came home and told, how can I say this? We have two missiles. <laughs> <laughs> and he told, who cares how many missiles we have? I'm not planning to start any war. Americans have to believe that we are strong. And, it, and they just swallowed this. They like this. They told, they tried to talk about missile gap, missile gap. And America live on the missile gap and all these fears. But all the time it was American superiority on all these things. And then it was also beginning confrontation and the policy of crisis. Because my father told that now I am a leader of the superpower. It is world power. Stalin was the leader of the regional power. So I have to be recognized as equal. And you know that Americans don't like to recognize anybody as equal. <laughs> but if you're not recognized as equal, what you're doing? You're challenging opposite side. You're trying to show, no, I am strong enough. It was Soviet policy of crisis. If Americans tried to do something somewhere, it was retaliation, not military, but diplomatic and others. It was the same like now. In 1957, they tried to start, how to say, operation over the Syria. And the Soviets began their military exercises in their territory and they pulled out. At that time, it was not Americans. It was mostly Turks, Turkey. Then in the, Next year, 58, it was revolution in Iraq, the same Iraq, and Americans landed in the Lebanon. Soviets started more, more exercise and then there. So this is, was policy of crisis around uh, all things. 
Americans don't want to recognize that Germany is the country that we have two Berlin crises. We have another Far East crisis. And each of them grew and grew and grew, and it was ended on the peak with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But I will come to this a little bit later. So it was this slow transition from war to the Cold War to the, what my father named the peace coexistence, that we can live together if we will find out how can we can do it. And it was many attempts to find this. And then in 59, it was my father's visit to the United States, and I was with him. And it was very interesting. I have no time to discuss all the things. But they also talk in the Camp David. And for example, when talk misunderstanding, Soviet Union, even the intelligence have no idea what this Camp David mean. And my father, and my father was very cautious. I have been treated as equal. So, first it was the salute. You are arriving in the Andrews Air Base. How many rounds of the salute they were present? At that time, nobody cared, but he told no, it is, I know Americans. They told 19. And they asked, and for the president, how many? They told 21. He told, I want 21. <laughs> they told the Americans answered the protocol, no, you're prime minister, so you will have 19. He told, we, we, invite, we will invite your president. And he told, yes, our president has to be 21. He told, but we also head of the government, so I will make 19 to him too. So they came to President Eisenhower <laughs> ask 19 or 21. They told, I'm not care, let's make two more. It will be. It's the same with Camp David. They asked Americans, my, no, not America, my father asked our foreign ministry, why Americans don't want to talk with me in the capital, Washington, and try to bring me to some camp? Is it humiliation? <laughs> but if you will tell you something that yeah, I'm inviting you to Gorky 9, you, nobody will know what is there. <laughs> And, and the foreign minister told, we don't know. So they send the message to the embassy, ask, what does it mean Camp David? And they explained them. And they told, yes, it's a good place. Right. And, you, and I'm saying these details not of the ignorance, but of this difference cultural. Mm -hmm. So they talked there. It was impossible to resolve these problems, what we tried to resolve, disarmament, but still it was no balance it Soviet Union have at the, in 59 maybe not two but not more than four missiles and they have to build something something more unification of Germany we cannot agree of any of the things because Soviet Union agree with unification of Germany if the West German will join East German. And the United States wanted unification of Germany if East Germany will join West German. So, Soviet Union told this, we recognize now the uh, West Germany. You have to recognize East Germany. But it was German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, he was strongly got, watching Americans and told, no, no, no. No recognition, no negotiations about this future. And like now, we are superpower, but we are dependent on his opinion. The same for, uh, we are dependent on the opinion on the Prime Minister Netanyahu of the Israel, because it was foreign policy is not so easy thing. So they could not find all these things. But it was two people, General Eisenhower and General Khrushchev, who went through the war. And my father was in the 
biggest defeat in the First and Second World War in Kiev and Kharkov, and biggest victory in Stalingrad and Kursk. And he knew what does it war mean. And he told me, if you read about war, if you watch about war, all this lie. Because the real war is much more bloody, much more dirty, much more ugly than anybody can imagine. And I want to avoid war for any cost. I don't want any war. And it was the same with the president. My father couldn't watch a movie about war because he told after this I cannot sleep. And when once I, once I present lecture together with historian David Eisenhower, the grandson of the president, and told him the story, he told the same with my, my granddad. He did, didn't watch movie about this. He also was so much big emotion about all these things. So they have a misunderstanding of the, each other. It is very important, many of these things. And it was their walks in the wood where it was no stable, it was more important. And when I say only two things, in one of these walks, President asked my father, how you deal with your military? And of course, my father was on the alert, and he, why I have answer, he thought that. He, and the President understood, and he smiled and told, I will tell you, my generals coming to me and told, Mr. President, we need new investment for new weapons, I answer them, we have a budget, you have your money. And they told it's not enough, and if you'll not give us, Soviets will build this, and you, it will be your fault if they will destroy our democracy. And told that I'm paying. And my father looked at him, he told, you know, they say, my, Marshal's coming to me and asking for more money, and I'm saying to them, it is no money. For some reason, he, he liked to show that there's no money behind his ear. <laughs> and uh, they're pushing me, told, if you'll not give us this money, Americans will build these weapons and they destroy our Soviet democracy. And I'm paying. And the president told him, Mr. Khrushchev, what do you think if we will sign the personal treaty between two of us against our military? And it was the same feeling about military industrial complex. They have their interest that was different than the interest of the country. And there is these two leaders who may maybe were last who can say their military, no, I will not pay for this. As Khrushchev told, I will not pay for the ships because I don't need them for the, my security. And you will just leave us without our <coughs> pencils if you spend all this money and they will defeat us. After that, military Russian complex took control of all countries it brought to all this disaster. It was very important because my father wanted to transform Soviet Union to the more effective economy decentralize this economy. We didn't talk about the, the time of the market, but it was many details. To make it more democratic, to make it possible to emerge of the new Stalin, a new dictatorship. And he tried to build this. And this reforming is very complicated because reforming, it is when everybody is not satisfied. Because the liberals saying it's not enough. Conservative told you're destroying our country. And you have to maneuver in between liberals and conservative. This is the country. 100%. And you are with the few followers between them. You're trying to do what the best, but through all the things. So he tried to make more democratic country to start the new elections to introduce not one party system and many other things, writing his new constitution. And he wanted to learn from the Americans. When he was here, in one of his speeches, he told, you are much ahead of us. You are much, your economy and you are managing much more effectively than ours. 
and we will learn from you and we'll be good students and sooner or later we'll be ahead of you and then you will follow us. And the same here, he started to talk, Mr. President, your second term is coming to the end, 1959. Next year it will be elections. Would you run for the third term? President told, no, I will not run for the third term because I'm not. And no, no, my father told, why? He told, because it is against the Constitution. He told, the Constitution. you can change Constitution. And I know Americans like you, and they vote for you. And it was long discussion between them, why you cannot change constitution, how it's important, what are the foundation of democracy. It was not because my father didn't understand this, because he wanted to find out how American system working. And after that, he came to the Soviet Union and he introduced this two-term policy to the Soviets. And most of the conservatives were, were very unhappy about this. And then when he was ousted of power, the, he, they just turned to back to all these things. So it was very important, this, and it was created new hopes. But then it was U-2 flight, and the gain of powers was shot over the Urals, and everything fell apart. It's natural why it was happened, because they planned my understanding, they planned the uh, Paris summit in May 1960. What they could achieve there? Nothing. Because it was impossible to find out anything about the Germany, unification and recognition, still not disarmament. They didn't discuss at the time human rights and others. But it was one thing, nuclear testing. Because my father told, we have stopped testing for any cost. And he stopped this twice in the Soviet Union, asking Americans to follow uh, us, and Americans did not follow. And, and I work with missiles, and I told them, we are not testing. We have the new uh, nuclear warhead to our new missile. And the old one, new one, is three times more powerful. It's two times lighter than the old one. But without testing, we cannot use them. But my father answered, we can destroy the world even now. And you can build the more and more destructive weapons. We have to do something. And for the president, it was the similar things. And it is my speculation that they could meet in Paris privately, not on the four, uh, four power summit, walking in, not in the wood, but in somewhere in the garden, and agree and say, during the, your visit to the uh, Soviet Union, we'll sign nuclear test ban treaty. And it was strong opposition in the Soviet Union to this possibility. I think for the same opposition on the United States. And somebody decided to blow up this. Because why they sent Gary Powers on May 1st? They told, we need to count another two missiles in Plesetsk or something else. But if you look respectfully, they told that CIA, as usual, was absolutely powerless. They didn't know about Soviet ability to shoot these planes. I know one of former CIA agents told, no, I, I made the photograph of these missiles in 1959, before the visit, before 1960, when was, was, pre, was President Nick, Vice President Nixon on the tour of Siberia. Uh, but they try to say, President, no, we have, they have no anti-aircraft missiles, no, mm, no planes who can reach this altitude. And secondary, on the April 12th, they sent another U-2 that flew over the that south area, and they came back because they couldn't shoot them. In, in one place, they have the anti-aircraft missiles without warheads. 
and other uh, say they have the interceptor can reach this uh, altitude but they have also no weapons and so but if you did it and then you will try to do in two weeks you understand everybody will be on the alert and they send this U2 through the Baikonur where you have the missile test site with strongly guarded all this then through the nuclear facility on the Urals they have to be strongly guarded by there. Then they have to fly over the Plesetsk, the only one intercontinental missile base Soviet Union that was strongly guarded. Then over the Severomorsk on the White Sea, where they have shipyards of the building nuclear submarine was strongly guarded. That over the headquarters of the North Fleet in near the Mormons and then to the Norway. Would I be who planning this flight? I will say, if now you will not shoot him, I don't know what more I can do for you. And they shot him. And then they provoke because the president told my father make big noise about this. We did it, we destroy you, we can we can shoot you. But same time he sent message, no, I want to speak with the president very seriously. Of course it is uh, we have, we, I want to have the serious business with you. And the president canceled the U2 program. But same time, State Department make their own statement that we will overfly your territory any time when we think we need it for our national security. Why? Nobody knows. Or you can imagine. Then the president, my father told, I will fly to the Paris one day before. And the president was there also one day before. And he told to his Secretary of State, Mr. Gerter, maybe I will apologize because if Soviets overfly my country in such a way, it will be the war. And they told no. So it was the idea that we must to blow up this. And they blew up this. And then it was another president, it was the president <clears throat> Kennedy, and starting from the very beginning, the same negotiation about the uh, uh, nuclear testing, the same negotiation about Berlin, but then emerged the new player, the Cuba. If we talk about Castro, we don't remember now that when Castro took the power, First place which he visited on the April 1959, four months after taking the power, was Washington DC. He went to the president and told, I want to speak with you and ask your support of the building democracy in my country. But president didn't want to speak with him for some reason. It was he asked the, uh, the vice president Nixon and Nixon was not the best negotiator in this case. So they reject, he was rejected. And if you are rejected from this side, you will find somebody, friends on the opposite side. And Soviet Union started to support him because if you have the enemy of your enemy, you have to help them as we're doing now too. But was very cautious. And the uh, Cubans became big heroes for the old Soviet Union. Before, we knew nothing about Cuba. It was too far from us. It was no diplomatic uh, presence there. But then, it was newly, new people came, young. It was all youth like them, all these young people. And I asked my father, why, why will not invite them in the Warsaw of Pact? Then Americans will not attack him. And he told, you know, they're too far. And if America will attack them, we will have obligation to start nuclear war against the United States over the Cuba, even knowing who is the Castro. <laughs> and it was no such period when we can understand what's happening. Maybe he will shake hands with American generals and we will destroy our country. Be cautious. But you have obligation with superpower. Everything changed on the April 17th. 1961, it was invasion there, and during this invasion, Castro 
announce that now he's joined Soviet bloc. And if he joins Soviet bloc, the leader the, the, uh, of, of this part of the world, the superpower, have obligation to protect all their allies, all their clients. And the Cuba became for the Soviet Union the same as the West Berlin for the United States. Small, useless piece of land deep inside hostile territory. But if you'll not protect it, even risking the nuclear war, you will lose your face and your other allies will not really trust you. So, it was the same then. My father told, how can protect Cuba? I cannot protect them diplomatically because nobody listened to me in the United Nations. I cannot protect them using the conventional forces because uh, Americans control communication and no difference. Coming. It have to be very strong signal. Let's send their missiles and it will be signal to the Americans, don't touch Cuba. But it was the very different understanding of the world, because what was the Cuban Missile Crisis? It was 100% American psychological crisis. So it was surrounded by the American air bases, American missiles, the way in Turkey, with what everybody remembers, also in Italy and Great Britain. We, we, we didn't care too much about this because all the time there were enemies at the gates on our borders. When Americans replaced Germans, nothing changed. You have to protect it. It is your obligation of the government, your obligation of the military. Americans were and are very different because Americans like a tiger most powerful predator in the world, but the tiger which grew up in the zoo. And so, and if you will allow them to go send them to the jungle, they, it will be afraid of the rabbits, of the mice, everybody, because they never saw it. It, it was the same as Americans. They saw, it's missiles on Cuba, they will attack us tomorrow, the people. All everybody, it was running and on. We make building shelters and all other things. Why? Why Soviet Union will attack from Cuba, not attack from the Soviet mainland? But it is psychological crisis, and you cannot answer this. You don't have this answer to this question. And we were very lucky that we have two presidents and leaders who were balanced. And they prefer negotiations because they first think, not shoot, and then think, and then think, maybe not shoot. And they started these negotiations. Because when you look in the, all these two weeks, it is weeks of very intensive negotiations. And the first, it was the announcement of the blockade. But if you listen, what the president said there. It was great fear in the Soviet Union, what the president will say. And he said, we will not allow, with strong voice, any Soviet ship which carry weapons to go through quarantine line. What does it mean? It mean you have decided would you want to negotiate or not? If you want to negotiate, you will not send such ships and you will decide. And my father stopped these ships with five ships. But he told, we have right to or the free navigation of the ocean. And he sent other ships through the quarantine line. And Americans never stopped them. It was signal, we understand you. These ships were stopped. So you think that they carry what we don't want you to carry there. Others. We trust you. And it was beginning of these exchanges of the letters, which is very important to negotiate with the opposite side. On the highest level, not like we're now negotiating with levels of ambassadors. 
And it was because they were, we had the strong leaders. Because strong leaders not, don't care what they think about you, him. Because he's strong. And I can come to you and tell you what I want to tell you. And listen to you. And, and I'm also a strong leader. But if you're weak, you're all the time afraid that they will think that you are weak. I have to be sure that I'm strong. I'm very strong. I'm very strong. I, I impose sanctions, ultimatums. So you have to surrender. That show the weakness. That making this policy very ineffective. Because if you impose the conditions of conditional surrender, opposite side will never accept it. Because it was only, you have to militarily defeat it if you will accept this unconditional surrender. It is creating more and more enemies in the world. And what does mean the successful policy you create friends? Unsuccessful policy you created enemies. And at that time it was this negotiation through all these tensions, which I cannot now talk without time. They came to the conclusion, yes. America will never invade Cuba, and you will take your missiles out. On both sides, maybe they wanted more, but it's like any bargaining. And they decided this, and they created the trust. And this trust brought them to the new mutual understanding. It was the President Kennedy, who in his American University speech, told, we have to deal with Russians, I trust Khrushchev, that he want to prevent the war. Khrushchev spoke on the meeting with the Defense Council and he said every day, he told, we are very different. American president is working in the interest of his country. I am working in the interest of my country. We have one in common. We want to prevent war if we can work together. It was beginning of this Moving on this direction, they signed nuclear test ban treaty. They created direct line. It was not telephone. It was they just rented the pair of wires that you mustn't wait until all these messages will go through the uh, private companies. Because before, as they told, the pre American president sent his letter to Khrushchev. They delivered this to the embassy. Embassy translated it, coded it and call to the Western Union, and Western Union send the message on the bicycle. That is true. So you have direct line. You sign nuclear test ban treaty. Soviet Union signed peace treaty with East Germany without any crisis. Uh, President Kennedy offered, let's fly together to the moon, because he was fear maybe Soviets can be the first that it will be not very pleasant to the United States. My father accepted this. So would they stay in the power longer? Maybe they brought the, us to the end of the Cold War in the late 60s. Because my father repeated to the President Castro when he told, you mustn't invest in your defense. You have to invest in proving life of your people. I trust Kennedy, he will be in, in office for next six years. You can then be the showcase of the better life to all Central Americans. But everything changed. On November 22nd, 1963, the president was assassinated. On the October 14, 1964, my father was ousted of power. A new leadership came there. And the military industrial came there. And they started this huge military build-up, balancing Navy with Navy, Air Force with Air Force, building. My father told that we need not more than 300 workers to destroy American infrastructure. However, that will not build even more missiles. We ended with 30,000 workers on each side. And now we, each reduction is too good, but it is still too more. And it happened what the, my father predicted. First, Soviet economy ran out of resources and the Soviet Union surrendered. It was not President Reagan who won the Cold War, no. Soviet Union did it for their domestic reasons and they decided not to compete. But I will not 
just blame President Reagan. He was like a hunter. You know, you go hunting to the forest for the bear, you found the dead bear and told, I killed him, it is dead. <laughs> so he presented this as a victorious way and everybody wanted to believe in this. And we came to the end of the Cold War when the Soviet Union decided to change this. And now we live in a very different world. It can, we cannot return to the Cold War. When they try to sell us this uh, idea, they think that it is people who don't understand. It cannot be Cold War against the Soviet Union, against Russia, because Russia now is not a superpower. Not even the regional power. It's a big country, nuclear power, but you will not compete with each other. And, the, and it is, but it is not the end of the competition confrontation. Confrontation now is in the economy. Who will have the stronger economy? Who will have the stronger currency? Who will have all those national economical institutions? Most of them in the United States. But I think now, like America, I have American citizenship and Russia citizenship. I'm concerned because we are still fighting the old war. We're increasing our military spending, which is really useless. We are trying to punish all these people who 50 years ago took the wrong side. And we're very much involved in the war in Yemen. You know how long they're fighting with each other there? You think two weeks? No. Ten years, as they, they told directly this war. Real war started there in 1956. Mm -hmm. And now we are concerned about all these things. We are investing billions in Iraq and then trying to, to confront Iran because punish them for the Ayatollah's crisis in 1968 and losing this confrontation, the economy, because everything happening not here. It was many Americans understand, but nobody wants to listen to them. Everything is the Pacific. Now, Chinese building one bank, tomorrow to be another bank. They're building this Silk Road now through the Pakistan. Who is the Pakistan? The best ally of the United States or best ally of China? I don't know. No, I think China is winning. They want to build the, the Silk Route for, through the Turkey, through the, through the Russian. So it was end, endless because our na nature is based on the competition and will compete with each other. I hope there will be no real winner because the good policy is creating friendship. But we'll see what will happen. Now I will finish. I spoke about 55 minutes, more than I expected. And I am ready to answer all your questions related with my talk, not related with my talk. It's no difference. It, and it is also no bad questions. If you ask bad question, I will give you a bad answer. Yes. Thank you. Um, as a child growing up in the 70s, I was very much interested in your sports program after watching the 1972 Olympics, but I also had that phobia that came from my parents' generation where I had this fear that if our country was going to be nuked or invaded, it would definitely be by the Soviet Union. So my question to you is when you were growing up, were you afraid of Americans, or did you think that one day you might want to move back to our country? You know, no, I never thought that I will uh, come to this country, no, not in my dream, not in my nightmare. <laughs> uh, you know, it is psychological difference. When I told you, you live in the peaceful environment, historically, as a nation. Nobody attack this country, nobody uh, other people. You are afraid of anything that can interrupt your life. Russians, like Europeans and Asian people, they live all the time with enemies at the gates. 
Russian came through the 20th century, through two, two world wars, several other wars, civil war. So we look at the enemies to the Japanese, in the period to the Germans with whom we fight, in some way to the Poles because of long confrontation with them. Americans were not friends. But they were not enemies, it was more curiosity about them. It was no hate. In this country it was this common expression, it was only good communists and dead communists. Nobody in the in, in Soviet Union said it was only good Americans, dead Americans. Mm -hmm. Because it was the feeling, yes, Americans our mm, I don't know what's what to say competitor, enemy, for, but uh, if they attack us, we would win. It was people's understanding. Military understood that Americans much stronger. And we took all the threats very differently, because you have this, all these exercises hiding under the tables and, and took it serious, building shelters, it was big business. I remember they told in my time the same, you have to hide uh, if you it will be nuclear explosion, and, and we, but we have the joke. If we see this bright blast in the sky, you have to lay down and uh, cover yourself with a black fabric and and slowly crawl to the cemetery. To the cemetery. <laughs> and the question: Why slow? Because you mustn't create panic. <laughs> and it was a re reaction, nobody took it seriously because they went through the, all this Second World War where shelters can be your grave or it was nothing, it was bombing and bombing and bombing and destroying. So it was different. We didn't look for Americans at the enemies. It was curiosity, it was many books which we like and we read it during the... Um, uh, our use in the peak of the Cold War. Mark Twain was maybe more popular in the Soviet Union than the United States. And uh, Mind Read and many others. Or you read the Moby Dick or other these stories or Jack London. I, what, it was just coming to my mind, it is. Many of these. They like this, the American movies, even the most of them very old, because it was still sanctioned on the Soviet Union, so it was no trade, so Soviet Union showed that movie that they took from Germany. They told, no, it was, we, we mustn't pay for your royalty for this. But sometimes it appeared there when they exchanged, we thought, if you'll take one more, our movie, we'll take your movie. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Of two powerful people, the President Eisenhower and your father, when they went to Camp Davis. And you said that they were together and they could talk to each other. Yeah. Do you feel that President Obama and Putin can have the same relationship by the uh, body language that we see in pictures? I have a, fee, I have a very big mistrust of Mr. Putin, especially after what he did with Crimea and the other things. So I really, I, I am, a, you know, apprehensive about what kind of an action Putin will, uh, will do and what do you feel about it? Putin in his own way trying to work in the interest of the national interest of Russia. I am not Putin's supporter, really. In many aspects, I don't like him. But other way, he was the person who restored the order in the Soviet Union and the Yeltsin, this dark decade, everything was destroyed. They didn't pay pension, didn't pay salary. It was the oligarchy there and he put them in the order. 
Very similar the pres in this country, the President Theodore Roosevelt ma made with the American oligarchy. From my understanding, in 58, he ran out of the ideas, and it will be best idea if he will not try to take power third time. Now Americans supported him very much in his popularity because with American regime change in Ukraine, most of the Russians now see this threat from the American side and the Putin looks like a protector. So he has a strong popularity. He's trying now to have re-energize himself because sanction show him it was like wake, wake up call. You mustn't based on the good relations with the West. You will sell oil and you will sell you everything. You have to restore your real economy. You mustn't like or you mustn't dislike the president. It is not your girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> it is the same. I can discuss Putin in many aspects with many Russians who supported them. We have very different opinion with my wife. My wife strongly supported him. And when, when I say he, he's wrong, he's starting to, uh, <laughs> to, to talk with me, not with him. The problem with American relations, they, for some reason, unfortunately, I didn't want to say this directly, that Obama is the weak leader. The same as Gorbachev was a weak leader. And he tried to show that he's a strong leader. And he's afraid, from my understanding, to meet with Putin because Putin is much stronger. And through this, he's bringing our relations somewhere, nowhere. Because what does it mean, the current anti-Russian policy? Putin will not start war against anybody, not against the United States, not against Estonia. Crimea is a very different case. I know Crimeans, I know they voted there. It was their decision, not Putin's decision, and he supported this. The Ukraine would never be the part of the uh, new Soviet Union because it will be impossible to restore that body. But Americans believe in this. Now we had Russia, which look 99% of <coughs> Russians toward Americans as the good friends in year 1991. Now the same 99% look at Americans as the enemies. It is very counterproductive policy. Yes, Russia was very strongly attached to the Western with their trade. Not United States, but Europe. And we're talking that European Union depended from Russia and all these things. The consumption of the oil and natural gas in Europe from Russia, 30%. Other 30% their own and Middle East. It's normal putting all these eggs in different baskets. Russian dependence from European Union was 70%. Much more dependent. Now they try to reduce this dependence. Can you isolate Russia? No. Russia now moving toward the China. They will not be leader there. China will be, never will be Russian ally. But they have more, more interest. They're building their common Eurasian economical space that is natural to any of the things. We, we have the same movement. I will not be surprised that in some period of time, Iran will join them, Afghanistan will join them, Pakistan, India, and other countries. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid of Putin. Ignore him if you don't like him. <laughs> and find somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your father and Eisenhower were, were both veterans and of, of very large wars. We haven't had wars like that any longer. Do you think that affects the uh, reason to agree <coughs> to peace between powerful leaders? 
But I told about this all my lecture about this. You're living in the pragmatic world. If you have your enemy who can destroy you, you'll never start the war. It's impossible the war between nuclear powers. And through this, it is in many aspects these countries trying to, to build the nuclear weapons. Sometimes nuclear weapons are instruments of peace, not instruments of war. And of course, uh, they are like uh, politicians. They're not based on the, uh, on the foundation of the personal feeling toward this person or other. Even it's feeling on the, in Soviet Union toward Eisenhower was very high because he was a so the honest general who don't want to steal our victory. He didn't want to take Berlin first. It's many things that uh, Soviets and even Russians now remember about him, but they're pragmatic. They based on their national interests to negotiate with each other and find some bargaining. It was this one of these pre prime minister of Israel told in uh, Great Britain, Great Britain have no enemies, have no friends, they have only British national interests. The same there. My father told about Kennedy, the same as in how they, they work in their national interests, I work in our national interests. We have one in common, let's prevent the war, and then see who will present better life for the people. By the way, what happened in 1991, what my father predicted, American told, show to the world that our people living better than you in Russia, and Russians decided we want to join Americans. It was American mistakes that now built all these new problems between this country. Yeah. How is Russia dealing with the um, decrease in demographics? With demographic, you think about the population? Yes. Russia, the same as the, any European countries, have the declining of the birth rate. Even now, they did many things to birth these uh, paying people, women, but you will not gave more no birth for money. I think all the women have also different interests. So they, the same as Europeans, they will resolve this problem through the immigration. Only then the problem, this country is the country of the immigrants. So for them, legal, illegal immigration, still it is uh, very common and historically easy understanding things. For the Russians, the same as Europeans. It is also psychological problems. How we can accept these alien people in our Russian motherland? Mm -hmm. They're not Russian. They have different eyes, they have different color. <laughs> we don't like them. But they will go through this. Many of the Russian things and uh, the <coughs> achievement based on the immigra immigrants now from the four post-Soviet states, from Caucasus, from Central Asia, including illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Now Moscow is very clean. I first, it was first time in the history of a clean city. Who cleaned this? Tajiks. They're ready to do it, and the people who who doing this, which Russian never would want to do this. So the problem of the illegal immigration is the problem that they try just to sell to us. What does mean illegal immigration? Mm -hmm. Anybody illegally immigrate here, if they have no future. If, if somebody will not offer them jobs, no. So if you really want to win this story with the illegal immigration, you have to impose fine on the businesses. If you will find this, I will, I don't know. Uh, you will pay 100 times more, and you will stop this. But it will be negative impact on the uh, development of the country. So it's a very controversial thing. And we can, of course, catch all these people who are illegally entering here. 
Another problem which Europe now facing, the immigration from this country that we destroyed. We started all these wars in the Middle East, and now these people who not looking about jobs, not looking about their prosperity, they try to escape from the misery of the war. And it is much bigger problem in Europe, but not in Russia. Uh, what's your reaction to, uh, to President Obama trying to normalize relations with uh, Cuba today? I think it's normal because if you want to have democratic Cuba, you have normalized these relations and starting flood of the American investment, American tourists there, because who supported Castro to stay in power for all this time? American president. Because if you are imposing all these hostilities, you saying, I'm only one who will protect you, support me. And majority supported Castro even with all their position. If they will not see the threat from the outside, and they see that all these Americans who are coming here, they're very friendly, it will be very, so it was very positive. I told before, but uh, my friends from State Department told, you don't take into account Cuban immigrants who hate Castro, they want to take power there, and they will never allow us, but they will never return. And also, the resort business in Florida, who also don't need more competitors <laughs> now. So I think it will be not easy to do it, but it will be good. You wanted to ask. I had a question. Uh, what do you think the uh, Putin, how, how would he react if our president went to the UN the way your father did and pounded on that podium with his <laughs> shoe? <laughs> You're, you're accusing our president of being weak. And I think he's trying to create a, a, a peaceful uh, demonstration that he wants this country finally to be seen as a peaceful country and trying to create peace throughout the world. I thought we treated your father very, very kindly when he came here to visit. And I would like to know what his reaction was to that visit and why we haven't had an equal chance, because we had that YouTube problem with uh, Francis Gary Powers, and then our president was not welcome in your country for a period of time. I was wondering, after all these years, why there hasn't been some kind of a reciprocal uh, response on the Putin side to try to get peace without all of this hoopla and increasing arms. Yeah, I, I, do, I really didn't understand your question, so many questions, but Putin, my <coughs> father, Eisenhower, by the way, my father never banged his shoe in the United Nations as part of the American propaganda. <laughs> we now discovered this. Uh, I will try to be very short. My father still had very, was very respectful to the President Eisenhower. It was many hopes after his visit to the United States. They talk about the uh, spirit of Camp David, that we can go, go forward. But then it was, as I told, it was created because my father told, how can I negotiate with the American president if he's saying me that he will violate my airspace in any time when he want? And I sit with him at one table, how, what will be our people tell about me? That we are second rank country. It was impossible. And it, it was the plan, as they understand, behind Eisenhower to blow up this. And he blew up this. And my father he did it only one thing, what he did. He withdrew his invitation. He told, if you did this with my country, how can I accept you as my friend next week? So when we talk about the President Obama banging his shoe, I think that he have to look in the, all this research and find that it is American prep, anti um, Russian propaganda, Soviet, which worked very well, threatening Americans with Khrushchev, who is shouting, I'm bury you, which he never said. 
And so you mustn't do the same mistake toward the rest of the world. As I told you, Putin is the leader of the Russia, which is not superpower, imposes no threat to anybody, and not the United States, not Germany, not Poland, not even Estonia. The, he had his own interests, mm -hmm. and he was dragged in the war in Ukraine, trying now to avoid this as much as we can. I cannot understand one, why Americans went to the Maidan, what the senator from Arizona lost in Ukrainian capital. He has no problems in Phoenix, no. I think no problems, only there. Why he told they support you? Why it was Americans who strongly supported regime change there? Not understanding, like, difference between Shiite and, Ira and Sunni before the Iraq and war. The Ukrainians are the same divided. Eastern Ukrainian, Orthodox, Orthodox and they uh, lived with Russia, less part of Russian Empire from 1654. Western Ukrainian is Catholics. Much big, the big difference is Shis and Sunni. And they lived in the part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These two part of Ukrainian now country, these people divided in 13th century. 13th centuries. 800 years ago, religiously, everything. And then they were merged together as Ukrainians after the Second World War. And it is their conflict here. They dislike each other more than Democrats and Republicans dislike them, each other in this country. And religious, culturally, everything. And uh, they will bond together by constitution, living in peace. Now we created civil war and they will fight. I, I think I'm half Ukrainian, half Russian. I have many friends there. It is big tragedy for Ukraine what we did for them. The same as was tragedy for Iraq and Syria and any other people. I hope it will not end it with the same uh, bloodshed as it was before. Putin would not want to take East Ukraine because Crimea was a Russian. And the Russians, the people want to back to Russia all the time. And they have their referendum and 99% of Russians supported them. They told Crimean ours. If he will not do this, he will lose all, all his popularity. But Eastern Ukrainian are Ukrainian. And then just building this rift between two Ukrainians. Because you see, if you have not recognized leadership in these Ukrainian regions, very well-developed regions there, we have 10% uh, of the population. They more and more think about them that now we are uh, equal to others, we're world players. Who knew them before? Now they negotiating with this and others, even not recognized. And this will make much more complicated to the Ukrainian government, which also have very strong pressure from the western part, part of the country. They're not pro-Western, and Eastern not pro-Russian. They're pro-Ukrainian, but they want to take control over them. What you will think if tomorrow it will be some coup in Washington, D.C., and Tea Party will take power and then impose, they told, now we will dictate you in New England what we, you, we want you to do. I think most of the people will be unhappy here. I don't think that we'll fight in civil war, but we have civil war. Same Ukrainians. So I would say, study history before you start in war. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two, two, part, two questions. One, what was, um, your dad's unofficial opinion of Stalin. And two, where do you feel um, the Middle East future is in terms of its relationship with Russia, especially a possible nuclear Iran? My unofficial 
feeling of uh, father's feeling of Stalin was the same as his official feeling. He was a murderer. He was the very brutal dictator or siren, very ineffective manager. He killed millions and millions of people. Really, he was one of the person who is guilty of the beginning of the Second World War, not because he attacked somebody, but because he did many things that will brought Hitler to the power and to the war. So he was, he tried to avoid emerging of any of this. Uh, a new Stalin in the Soviet Union. But he was also very affected by Stalin. Stalin was very charismatic, like, like Hitler. But it was a psychological problem. About Middle East, Russia now is not a big player in the Middle East. It's, it's controlled by United States. United States doing their everything what they want. Now Russia try to, not confront it, but not to support many of the things. And everything future of the Middle East depends from the United States. Unfortunately, American policy very destructive from my understanding. About future of Iran, I think that we are too much focused on the punishing wrong small guys. You took this power and we will punish you because we have the hostage crisis. But who, who created this crisis? It was Americans, because if Americans will not overthrow democratically elected Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953, it will be no Shah, it will be democratic Iran, it will be a very different country. When we talk about the nuclear Iran, I don't believe in the threat to the world from Iran. Iranian leaders and Ayatollahs, they're stubborn, but they're pragmatic. And when we see that nuclear weapons are destructive or they're creative, Soviet Union built nuclear we weapons to balance United States. And after that, it was balanced, called war, competition, no war. China tried to do the same with the Soviet Union and United States. India and uh, Pakistan did the same. We have seven wars before nuclear weapons there. Now it is no wars. Now we have only one nuclear superpower in the Middle East, Israel. And Iran tried to balance it. I don't think that they really want to build nuclear weapons. But I have no fear about nuclear Iran. They will have few weapons, so they will say, don't attack me, and nobody will attack him, and then they will try to work in their own way. They have their own understanding of this, and we have to negotiate with them. You see, Iran is a relatively small country with very bad relations with the United States. And we're trying to play our domestic games by using this Iranian case. If we really want to resolve this problem, I will say what happened in my time in 1954-55 in, in our area. We have very bad relations with Yugoslavia. Stalin blamed him even harder than we blaming Ayatollahs, the enemy of all them. And then my father told, let's look, why they're so bad? Why is they bad? They, they have their own understanding. We have to improve relations with them. And they started to taste the water. And then it was stronger position in the Soviet Union. They're so bad and so, and they told, yeah, okay, we agree. Let's invite uh, President Tita to the Soviet Union. And my father told, you see, he's the leader of the proud Yugoslavian people who won uh, the, their fighting against Germans. And we are a great country. If we we'll invite here, he will have this pressure that will bring in him trying to do something. I am not care. I will fly first there. I will apologize and improve relations. And he did it. If really it is, will be such fantastic idea, what I would say, the best way, Take Air Force One, fly to Tehran, the Ayatollah, where are you? 
let's have some juice together, mm -hmm. drinking, you know, <laughs> drinking there. What you're feeling about us? Well, you think that you are bad, but you look not so bad as, as uh, I heard from State Department. Mm -hmm. And then it will be very different. Will became, became friendship or such hugging? No. After all these visits, we have many tensions with Yugoslavia. Here, there, it was going up and down, but it is natural in foreign relations. What do you think, Mary? More questions, or we have to? Yeah. One last question. Yeah, in 1962, I was eight years old, and um, I remember the uh, President Kennedy came on and he was talking about the missiles in Cuba and everything. And I remember uh, my family being very cautious and upset and started buying different stuff at the market and storing water and all that. I was wondering what the response was in Russia at that time. Were they as scared as the uh, people in the United States was? No, it was business as usual. First of all, I told you because we live through different wars and this tune that you cannot uh, store so much goods. It really was not such fear. Usually when it is happening, uh, it is fear and the panic in, this, in Russia. You he see one thing, people buying salt and matches. In Russia, it w matches. Why? Because if there will be no electricity, it will be no matches, you need fire. <laughs> And you need salt. I don't know why. Why? But but it was. And uh, about and about Cuban Missile Crisis, as I told you, it was American psychological crisis. For the Soviets, even with talk, not talk about all this historical perspective, it was no difference between Cuban Missile Crisis or, for example, Berlin Crisis. If if it will be the war, it will be nuclear war on the Soviet territory. So we live through these two Berlin crises and the previous Stalin's type Berlin crisis. And uh, we much more adjusted to the things. Americans was very different. In Berlin crisis, Americans thought if they will, it will be war, they will kill each other in Europe and will watch them on TV. And now you fear we can be filled. We are mortal. And it's created panic. Because America have three real such impact on their psychology. First it was Sputnik. Or oh, they, they have this launcher, they can uh, launch the missile. Tomorrow they launch missile, they will kill us. It's very difficult to President Eisenhower to convince them. We are still stronger, many, many, many times stronger. No, people was this fear. Then Cuban Missile Crisis. Then after that, 9-11. 9-11 was good luck for the terrorists. They was able to aim these two towers. It was very difficult, except all other things. And all Americans after that believe that now Al-Qaeda is occupied the United States. After the 9-11, I visited the Washington DC. Everything was fortified, mm -hmm. everywhere. It is such feeling that during the night is controlled by, by Al-Qaeda and we're afraid of all these seeds. All our uh, embassies fortified, it's a shame. You fortify embassy of the free country not allowing the people to enter them. You're making all this searching in, in all other, uh, all, all these areas. Yes, it can prevent another terrorist attack, but it will much more negatively affect the image of the United States. And even our prosperity is with wasting trillions of dollars of the Homeland Security who will search all my shoes. You can, no, no, I'm very serious. These people, thousands of people watching on my shoes, and they tell, no, you're eight years old, you can keep your shoes on. Why? Maybe I'm even worse than there. And I have in my shoes something very nasty. Diapers, even. So, in Soviet Union at that time, it was very different. 
our feeling toward all the things. So, and the Cuban Missile Crisis went through. The Soviet hawks blame Khrushchev that he surrendered and he withdrew his missiles there. Even Khrushchev told, American accepted our conditions not invade Cuba. The same like here, hawks to blame President Kennedy, you have to attack Cubans and then destroy all of them. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, sir.